Okay, so I got a little bit passionate there and got a little bit behind time, so hopefully we'll catch up. So we know that God created man. The next question is why? I mean, look around. Why on earth would God create us? Well, some said that God created man because he needed somebody to love. My answer is God is not Freddie Mercury. He didn't need to find somebody to love. God is love, and within the Trinity, there was already existing perfect love and fellowship. It wasn't that God was lonely and somehow missing part of himself. He didn't create Adam and say, you complete me. It wasn't that he needed man. God is self-sufficient. He needs nobody and nothing. Before creation, love existed within the Godhead. There was perfect fellowship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God wasn't lonely. God wasn't incomplete. And man in no way completes God. So why did God create man? This is a question people often ask, and I've heard all kinds of answers like, it's inheriting God's creativity or God was bored or whatever. But scripture gives us the answer to this very clearly. We were created for one purpose, and that is to glorify God. Isaiah 43 tells us that. Compare that with Ephesians chapter 1, 11 to 12. Our purpose is to glorify God. At the root of sin, essentially, is the thought of taking for ourselves that which rightfully belongs to God. When Satan fell, Satan said, I want to be like God. I want for myself the glory that belongs to him. I want to be equal with God. When Adam sinned, he said, I want to be like God, choosing for myself what is right and wrong. I want to take for myself that which belongs to God. When we sin, generally there is a component within that of, I want to take for myself that which rightfully belongs to God. I want to please myself rather than him. I want to satisfy my needs rather than his. We were created for the purpose of glorifying God. And so if we want to be satisfied, we need to understand our purpose. If you want, um, I was really blessed a couple of months ago. I was given a Land Rover, which was a massive blessing. And I've never owned a 4 by 4 before. So the first day I got in this Land Rover and sat down and looked at it, and I looked at all these knobs and buttons, and I thought, I have no idea what these things do. So I am not going to touch them until I found out what they do. Because if I start touching them and I don't know what they do, something could break. If I want my Land Rover to perform as it was designed to perform, and do the things it was designed to do and function for that reason that it exists, then there are certain things that it should and should not do. And it's the same for you and I. that There is an instruction manual, fortunately, that we've been given. But if we want full satisfaction, we need to find out what we were designed to do. If we were designed and God said, I will create man in order that he can go out every Saturday night and get blind drunk, then that's what we should do because that is what would give us mass satisfaction. However, if that's not what we were designed to do, then whilst we will go out and think it will give us satisfaction, ultimately it will damage us. And that's what sin does. Sin promises satisfaction whilst actually denying us true satisfaction. So. Why do people sin? Because it's horrible? No, people sin because it's pleasant. I have never, I'm just confessing here, I have never been tempted to eat boiled cabbage. Don't know about you. It's just, it's not a struggle I've lived with. If God said, thou shalt not eat boiled cabbage, 
If that was the only commandment, I could go through life living perfectly. I wouldn't need Jesus because you know what? I think I could manage to get through life without ever being tempted to eat boiled cabbage. Yeah, you with me? Because it doesn't appeal to me. So why would I sin? It's because it appeals to me. It, it has the offer and the promise of fun. It has the promise of satisfaction. Drugs do it. Alcohol does it. Pornography does it. And it actually ultimately leads to dissatisfaction. And you want more and more of the same thing in this vain hope that it will satisfy, but it don't, it's pleasurable for a while and then brings destruction. I, said, I was preaching on Sunday. I said, you know, as Christians, we need to be happy people. You know, but, you know sometimes people talk about miserable sinners. And I look around and think, no, no, no. Most sinners are a lot less miserable than half the Christians I know. But they're out there having fun because the, the sin is promising them fun for a while. Why do people go off and have sex with people they're not married to? Because sex is fun. I know that shocks some people. I said, God created it to be fun. Because he said, be fruitful and multiply. He wanted it to be easy for us to be fruitful and multiply. So he made sex fun. If sex was like eating boiled cabbage, there'd be a lot less children in the world. But there are certain things he, he has given us and he's given us appetites and we can live out our lives fulfilling those appetites in a godly way that glorify him or in a way that pleases us. And if we live in a way that pleases us, it's not simply that God has chosen random things to make us miserable. It's that if we live in a wrong way, it damages us emotionally, physically, spiritually. So I know it's not politically correct to say this, but for example, one of the reasons why I believe that we should reach out to, to the homosexual community with the gospel is that the homosexual lifestyle damages individuals. Research after research has shown that, that gay men have more disease, more depression, higher rates of suicide, shorter life expectancy, suffer more domestic abuse, um, less satisfaction in life, and less happy. There's the irony that it's the gay community, where every bit of research shows that they're actually less gay. Okay? So I'm not saying, I, I don't want to destroy homosexuals. I want to destroy that thing which is destroying homosexuals. And let them know that by the grace of God, just as I was a sinner living in my own impulses which were destroying me, and by the grace of God and his mercy, I came to know him and know a better way of living that has given me far greater satisfaction. Everybody can know that. And I want everybody to know that. That I was created to glorify God, and when I do glorify God, I, there's a sense of satisfaction and purpose and fulfillment that nothing else can give me. God fulfills me and gives me a joy that nothing else can. Preaching like this comes close. So we exist to glorify God. And that whenever we choose not to glorify God, we're sinning. Because we're not living according to the purpose that he's chosen for us. Now some people say, well, isn't that arrogant? God, God says, your purpose is to glorify me. He's created all these people just to glorify himself. Well, that's fair enough because you know who God glorifies? Himself. Now, that sounds really arrogant, right? Well, if you live to glorify yourself, that really would be arrogant. If I live to glorify myself, even that would be arrogant. But why is it not arrogant that God lives to glorify himself? Because God is humble. God has an accurate measure of his own worth. And God knows for sure that there is nothing and nobody higher in creation worth glorifying. God understands that he's perfectly holy and perfectly loving and perfectly just. And so to glorify him is to glorify love and justice. God is humble. That's why he glorifies himself. 
Only when we've understood the origin of mankind will we find the true meaning of life. Then we will find our purpose. Then we will know why we're here. In the Westminster Catechism, a catechism is a, a teaching tool, a series of questions and answers. And the question is, what is man's chief end? The answer, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. John Piper twists that slightly and says, man's chief end is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And I don't have a big problem with that either. Abundance or fullness of joy is found in knowing God, enjoying fellowship with him, delighting in who he is, in glorifying him. When we understand that, for me, that is one of the most powerful weapons against temptation. I can tell you, don't do this, don't do that, because God says so. And that should be enough for us. But it isn't, often. But if I have a true understanding that that, that magazine I want to look at or that TV show or that, that thing on the internet or that, that woman that I want to look at or that extra piece of cake I want to eat or whatever it may be, is actually something that will prevent me glorifying. It will rob me of joy. It will rob me of, of fulfillment. Then it helps me to say, you know what? I'm not losing out by not doing those things. I'm gaining by not doing those things. And that's the biblical worldview, that Jesus has set us free. What's he set us free from? A whole bunch of things, including the power of sin, that we now have the power to say no to sin. It's not as many atheists would suggest that we're, we live a boring life because we can't do anything fun anymore. No, no, no. They don't have the power to sin. They're powerless to overcome sin. And because I, if I'm in a situation where I'm powerless to overcome sin, I can actually die of despair or begin to justify why my sin is pleasurable and why it's my choice. And that's what the world does. And it's given over to a deception. But we need to understand that glorifying God is the reason we were created. So if God created us and he created us for his glory, what are we made up of? What? what what are we? Well, we're told that man is made in the image and likeness of God. That's Genesis 1.26. The Hebrew word selim, which means image, and demut, which means likeness, both mean something similar, but not identical. One picture is this. The image of something. It's like looking at the reflection of the sun on the sea. When you look at the, sun, the reflection, you get the picture of what the real thing is. But it's not as powerful. It's not as beautiful. It's not as bright as the real thing. And that is the image. The Greek word for image is icon, which is where we get icon from. Okay. But it's a picture. An icon is, is something that represents something else. So the question is, in what way... Are we made in the image of God? Does it mean we look like him? Again, looking around this room, I certainly hope not. You know, how tall is he? You know, uh, what color hair does he have? What race is he? You know, those, those are questions people ask in ignorance. That what does God look like if man was made in the image of God? But we know that it can't be that man looks physically like God. Okay, that's not a problem to some sects. Mormons actually teach that God has a physical body. But they also teach that God was once a man who worshipped his God, who was once a man, who worshipped his God, who was once a man. And that as a man, if I worship God and I'm a good Mormon, I can one day become a God. And take my wife and we'll have babies and inhabit some planet somewhere and those people will worship me, and then so on and so forth. So Mormons have a, a worldview that God has a physical body because he was once human. And isn't it interesting? Every worldview that sets itself up against the truth does one of two things. It either reduces, tries to reduce God 
to man's level or elevates man to God's level. We've got to have a worldview that says, man and God, though we are made in his likeness, we are not in any way equal. We cannot become God. But God doesn't have a physical body. He is spirit. If you want more detail on that, you should have done a previous module. But anyway, or a previous course. Does it mean man was made in the image of God in the fact that man has an intellectual capacity to reason, to be self-aware, and to make rational decisions? Intellectually, we see that man is somehow distinct from the animals, right? Again, the world will try and always point out where animals look very human. Look, this elephant can paint. Yeah, this monkey can do sign language. But I've never seen a chimpanzee sit there contemplating the meaning of life and discussing philosophy with another chimpanzee. There's something intellectually distinct about humanity. And again, evolution would say, well, that's simply because we're more highly evolved. And I look around and someone say, I'm not so sure about some of you. But anyway... So some people argue that being made in, in the image of God is the fact that we have that intellectual capacity to, to reason, just as God has a capacity to reason. And in Isaiah, he says, come, let us reason together. Some argue that the likeness of God means that man has the capacity to conceive of, conceive of abstract issues, that we're into philosophy, moral questions. It's only man um, that has a distinct um, awareness of morality. I think it was Aristotle who said, uh, man is the only creature that can blush or needs to. Some have said that man being a moral being is how he is uh, in the likeness of God. Um, that man isn't simply driven by base instincts, as Freud would have argued, but by a sense of morality, that originally man was morally pure, and though that, that purity was distorted by sin, that he was created morally pure, just as God is morally pure. Some have suggested that to be in the image of God is simply that man is able to communicate with God in a way that no other creature is. Some have suggested that it means that man is a social and relational being. He's aware of the needs of others and is able to give and receive love in a manner different to the animal kingdom. Some have said it simply means that man has a spiritual as well as a physical life. Because while death came to all of creation, it was only man that spiritually died with the fall. Some say it's because man is made up of body, soul, and spirit, which reflects the Trinity. More on that maybe next week. And some have said that it's the function of man uh, that, that is what it's speaking of here. That when it says man is made in the image of God, it's speaking of the role of man in exercising authority on behalf of God over creation. And the way that I am the image of God, the way that I'm the icon or the, repre the representation of God is that as I exercise authority over creation, I'm doing what God has called me to do, and I'm representing him in the authority that I carry. Those are all theories about what it means that man was made in the image or the likeness of God. Some have tried to even say, well, the image is one thing and the likeness is another, and start dissecting words like only theologians with nothing better to do can get up to. Be worth theologians, full-time theologians. They've got nothing to do except come up with amazingly in-depth discussions about nothing like did Adam have a belly button and things like that. The meaning of the original seems to have been clear, though, to its original audience. I don't think we need to overanalyze it too much. I think if we look for too narrow a definition, we're in danger of causing controversy when there needn't be one. And that's what happens with, often with biblical scholars. We start splitting hairs and arguing over, you know, Jesus talked about the, um, the Pharisees tithing and even picking the 
you know, one-tenth of the little mint and the dill off the herb gardens. You know, we can get so caught up with minutiae that we, we miss the big picture. And then that's where church splits come. You know that ch some churches split over one word. Over one word. Whether something should read. Because in Greek, um, certain prepositions can have multiple meanings. And it's the context that determines the meaning. And so they'll say, some, was something of the Spirit or something in the Spirit? And churches have split over that. Oh, my goodness. Have you missed the big picture of love and unity and you've split over a word whether it should be of or in? I just want to tell them to get a life. But if we, that's what happens. We, we, we can get very contentious if we, if we become too narrow and too dogmatic in our thinking. I think it's safer to allow a wider interpretation that allows us simply to believe that man is intrinsically like God in some ways and was created to have a special relationship with God that was impossible for the animals. I don't think it really matters to us to go into much more depth than that. Do you? Does, does, is it really worth spending 20 years of, of Bible study to figure out which of any of those little definitions is actually the accurate one? In fact, in many ways, for me, I just fall on my face and say, God, how could you possibly even put in your word that we're in your likeness in any way whatsoever? My, my girls love, there's an album of songs, um, songs from the story, it's called. And each of the songs is, is from the perspective of a biblical character. And there's one song from the perspective of Adam and Eve after the fall. And they said, if only we could just turn back the clock and, and, and just fix that one mistake so that we could just walk with you one more time and we could just talk with you one more time. If we could just... How... And then in the chorus it says, how could you look at me and say, it is good? And I hear that line and I just go, oh, God, how could it possibly be that you could look at man and say, it is good. How could you in your word dare to say that we were created in your image when you are infinitely superior to us? That's the greatest mystery about that statement for me. I think it is fair to say that when we are created in his, likewise, in his image or in his likeness, there are moral aspects to that. There are spiritual aspects to that. There are mental aspects to that. There are relational aspects to that. And that there are authority aspects to that because they're all part and parcel of the nature and character of God. And we are called to be those who carry something of his nature and something of his character on this earth. And as we looked at in a previous term, when we looked at the, the nature and character of God, there are certain aspects of his nature and character that are called his communicable attributes, and some which are his non-communicable attributes. In other words, we can never be omnipotent. We can never be all-powerful. We can never be omniscient or all-knowing. We cannot be omnipresent or e present everywhere at once. There are certain aspects of God that we can never carry, but there are certain attributes that we can. God is love. God's justice is righteousness, is holiness. Those we can carry. And when we carry those, is it not true to say, then we become a representative of God. Then we walk in his likeness. When Adam was made in his likeness, he carried those things perfectly. In his innocence, without the taint of sin, without sin having broken that likeness, we too were broken and didn't carry the likeness of God, but by the power of Jesus Christ, by his mercy and his, gra his grace, we, when we surrender to him, take on something of his identity. His righteousness is imputed or given to us undeserved. And then 
we carry something of the glory of God with us. And when it comes to the lost being saved, and that should, have been, that should be one of our highest priorities, we can go forth with truth and, and arguments and all of these things, and, and we need to be well prepared. We need to be wise in what we say. But ultimately, how will people know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ? By our love. When they see in us something of the nature of God that is desirable. Gandhi famously said, apparently, I like your Christ, I don't like your Christians. An accusation that people throw against the church now all the time. And unfortunately, there's some truth in that. Of course, we are fallible. When some people say, I won't go to church, it's full of hypocrites. I say, it's not full, we've got room for a couple more. But you know, saying you won't go to church because it's full of hypocrites, for me is like saying I'm not going to the gym, it's full of fat people. So people look at us and we will fail. But ultimately, as we trust God, isn't it when they see something of the living God in us that they will be drawn to him through us? That people will argue the Bible and the inspiration and talking snakes and donkeys and resurrections and dinosaurs and arcs and all of these arguments that people come up with. And then you say, well, let me tell you my story. You know, somebody once said to me, Christianity is evil. Why do you say that? Well, the Crusades and this and this and this. Whoa, so you're telling me something that happened a thousand years ago is your justification why Christianity is evil. I said, you know what? Christianity is so evil. I know literally hundreds of people who've been delivered of drug addictions, alcohol addictions, um, the scars of abuse. Failed marriages have been restored. People who are suicidal, filled with joy. Prisoners reformed. I said, you come and meet my friends. Let me tell you about my life. Let me tell you how he transformed me. And let my friends tell you how he transformed them. And you see the fruit of people who love Jesus. Then come back to me and tell me what I believe is evil. Don't give me some abstract argument that Richard Dawkins came out with in his nonsense book a few years ago. Come and see the real thing. And when they see Jesus in us and the fruit of the Spirit, their fancy arguments will count for very little. We are to be those who understand we were created by him and for him. We were created for the purpose of glorifying him. And one of the most incredible scriptures for me in the book of Peter says, we will be partakers of the divine glory. that just mind-blowing? When I look at how sinful and depraved I am, how weak and stupid, how inconsistent, how easily I fail and how often I fail, and then it says, I will be a partaker in God's glory. And while I walk this earth, before I walk in the fullness of glory, in a glorified body in the presence of Jesus, whilst I walk this earth, I have a deposit by the Holy Spirit in me. To let the world see that God is real. God is great. And God is merciful. Our theology, our understanding of creation, our understanding of the Bible, we can do Genesis in its original language, we can do it all. If we're not seeing people saved, does it really matter? 
If we're not showing the world that Jesus lives, does it matter? I think it was Francis of Assisi. And I hate this statement. I hate it, but there's truth in it. It says, wherever you go, preach the gospel. And if you must, use words. What I hate about that statement is, I know very few people who got saved without the words. But what I love about this statement is that understanding of people will judge our lives before they judge what we have to say. You know, I've talked a little bit about the gay community. You know what? The church has failed the gay community over the years. And it's failed it two ways. One, by rejecting homosexuals and making them feel that they can't walk into a church. That they feel that the moment they walk in a church, the issue of who they sleep with is far more important than who the heart belongs to. That they're judged because their sin is somehow worse than ours because they're tempted in a different way to me. And I can point fingers at a homosexual while I'm battling with pride and, and, and my own lust issues. And the church has failed the homosexual community because the homosexual community thinks the church is, thinks that they're the enemy. The other way the church has failed the homosexual community is to go the opposite way and say, it's okay. God doesn't need you to change. And both ways we're failing to reflect Jesus and his love and his mercy would spend time with anybody and draw them in and then say, once you know me, I will give you the grace the power to change your life to become more like me. I don't want it to be said of us that we failed the community in which we live. That we failed to represent Jesus well. Let what we've said tonight about being made in the image of God, by God, for his glory, Ignite within us such a deep sense of anguish that many others who were also created for his glory by God in his image are going to a Christless eternity. That they too have dignity and worth and value and they too are loved by God. And we preach to them not in arrogance that we've got it together, but in humility knowing that we too a sinner saved by grace. That we come to Christ not because we're strong, but because we're weak. And some will reject us for it. It's inevitable. But you know what? Some want. Some want. And some lives will be changed. Some people will begin to live to glorify God themselves. And a time is coming, Scripture says, when the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the whole earth, just as the waters cover the sea. Can we be those who are part of seeing the knowledge of the glory of the God spread across this whole earth? I hope so.